Hey everyone, welcome back to the Hardware News Recap of the Week. And this one, we're talking about AMD RDNA 3 drivers, Copium, and uh, prefetch shader behavior. We'll also be going over Intel Arc and the driver updates that improve DX9 performance specifically. Additionally, AMD's Ryzen non-X CPUs in the 7000 series to set a lower price floor for the AMD AM5 CPUs, uh, like the 7600X, except now with, with one fewer X bringing it down to a total of approximately zero X's per product name. Therefore, they're irrelevant. If you don't have at least one X, then uh, it's not worth buying. That's, that's what F XFX says anyway. So let's get started. Before that, this video is brought to you by Be Quiet and their Silent Wings 4 fans. The Silent Wings 4 fans market themselves as being useful on radiators, tower coolers, and cases alike. The fans have a six pole motor and use a fluid dynamic bearing, which helps with the noise profile and with longevity. The fans use anti-vibration mounts for reduced noise transfer to the case and have a rated lifespan of 300,000 hours. Learn more at the link in the description below. Up first, we're doing an end of year charity drive for a local computer engineering classroom for a high school where they teach computer engineering, SAS, uh, Cisco certification, some programming, stuff like that. And we wanna help them with buying new supplies like new computers to get them off of their FX CPUs. I'm still using one at home, but we'd like to get them on something better uh, and additional supplies for students. So this program is awesome. It's actually taught by our own Patrick Stone at the local public high school. And we're going to be giving them 10% of all of the store.gamersaccess.net revenue until the end of this charity drive. Uh, in addition to doing our power supply testing and transient testing for our 4090 review, our 7900 XTX review, Patrick Stone also teaches computer engineering, software programming, SAS and Cisco certification, uh, and other similar programs to high schoolers. And the money will go towards equipment purchases for the classroom. It will also help fund basic school supplies for students who need access to things that they might not be able to otherwise afford for the classroom. So the school has also requested additional ESD mats and ESD straps. Since we make and sell our own mod mats and ESD straps for those alongside common ground points on store.gamersaccess.net, which you can buy over there as well if you'd like, they're excellent for PC building projects, they are heat resistant for tube bending, and they're anti-static. Because we make these, in addition to the 10% of the revenue we're donating, we're also going to be donating an ESD wrist strap, a common ground point, or an anti-static mod mat for the school to use for each order that is placed on our store up to 150 orders. That would be enough to accommodate all the students in the program. So if you place an order on there up to the first 150, we'll give them either a mod mat, strap, common ground point, something they can use in the classroom for their PC building and computer hardware educational purposes. Patrick Stone, alongside being an excellent teacher on our YouTube channel for things like some of our power supply reviews, is also an excellent teacher in the classroom, and we want to help enable him to get the equipment he needs. So you can go to store.gamersaccess.net to help with all that, to grab things like our coaster packs, which make excellent gifts. We have the new coaster pack version two that's in stock and shipping now. We also have our mouse mats in stock and the black and blue wireframe and the red and black HUD design. And we have the PC building anti-static mod mats. If you want a rugged surface to build on to protect your table during the build and also to protect your components. We also just restocked basically all of our shirts. We'd been out of stock for months now. So now is the perfect time to go pick one up because in addition to getting an awesome shirt and good design with high quality material, 10% of your order will also go to supporting the equipment purchases for the CET room. Shirt designs we have in stock include the PC component t-shirt in tri-blend and cotton. We also have our hourglass silicon sand shirt, which is the front only version of the disappointment build shirt from earlier this year. We just restocked hoodies as well, including fall lightweight hoodies and some heavier hoodies for winter and plenty more like the PC shortage t-shirt and the classic teardown logo. Okay, first news story. It's about AMD Ryzen. So uh, rumors of AMD's new Ryzen 7000 CPUs have been rampant for the last couple weeks, and now they're starting to get some more detail. Uh, currently, video cards with the Z points out that the Ryzen 7000 series, including the 7900 non-X, 7700, 7600, both non-Xs as well, uh, will start with prices at $230 to drop that X suffix. In the 7900 XTX review, we talked about X inflation, Xflation, as it's commonly known among economists like us 
or something. Uh, but this X only costs twenty dollars because at two hundred thirty for the seventy six hundred non X, you spend an extra twenty bucks, you get up to two fifty for the street price of the seventy six hundred X. It's actually not that big of a difference this time. Three hundred thirty is what the rumored price is for the R seven seventy seven hundred, and then four hundred thirty for the rumored R nine seventy nine hundred. And for reference. The 7600 we saw as low as 240 bucks. Uh, officially, it's 300 MSRP, but it doesn't seem like many people are really selling it at that price. The 7700X is 350 on Newegg right now, so that's another gap of only $20. And then the 7900X is 474, so that establishes a larger gap of $44 against the 7900 non-X. The rumored clocks in the video cards table drop significantly, but we're guessing that removing the power limits will allow these parts to boost higher and closer to the XSKU performance. That'd be similar to the era of the Ryzen 1000, 2000, and 3000 CPUs, where typically we would recommend buying the non-X part, like the 1600 or 2600 non-X, and then just overclocking it to get to the X part performance, save you, on average, back then, $50, and uh, you basically get the same thing out of the box. In this case, it's a little different. So more likely what you'll do is remove the power limits, and we talked about this in our Eco Mode benchmarks for the 7950X, one of the things we said we wanted to see was something like a 7950E or something where it just has eco mode more or less pre-configured because most people will never mess with it. Uh, and that's kind of what they're doing here with these. So if you remove those limits, assuming there's no restriction on removing the limits, you'll probably get the X SKU performance. We'll look at that uh, if these things ship and if we're able to actually review them. These CPUs will also likely include coolers. They'll have less value if you intend to turn the limits off, especially with Ryzen boosting to a thermal target of 95C when unlimited, but they'll likely be sufficient for the TDP bound scenarios. And for TDP, that drops on these parts to 65 watts, uh, down from 170 watts and 105 watts for the X variants. So for now, we don't know exactly when they're coming out, but typically AMD, Intel, and Nvidia have something to say and launch around CES which is going to be about the first, second week of January, so it's coming up fast. Now, next one, RDNA 3 Copium. Some driver wishes and some bugs in scare quotes there. Uh, after we posted our 7900XTX and 7900XT reviews in Taiwan, differently from what we usually do, we basically immediately moved away from the GPUs and back to what we were doing. We were overseas, so we went back to factory tours and trying to put together content. That means that we didn't monitor the situation for the GPUs this time, which means that uh, it, was, it was almost therapeutic. I was insulated from all of the rumors that typically swirl the internet toilet after a GPU launch when people talk about how could it be better or why was it so terrible. So apparently in that time, unbeknownst to us, Millions of voices cried out about GPU performance and then were suddenly silenced. A tweet claimed that AMD's shader prefetch function was dysfunctional and defective and that early samples of the 700 XTX and XT were lower quality silicon and also would improve potentially with driver updates in a uh, non-standard way, it's not, not the typical improvements you would get from a driver. It suggested that performance would get better in later silicon revisions as well. And following up on that, Tom's Hardware spoke to AMD, which is exactly what they're supposed to do when there's some kind of major negative uh, discussion point like this, and asked AMD, hey, is this thing that Twitter said true? And AMD said, no, it's not true. The code's working as intended and as designed. As for the driver, so just that, that bug is like a thing you don't need to think about anywhere. As for the driver copium, that's one that we did notice in the comments. So we noticed that some people expect AMD driver performance will improve significantly with the 7900XTX, 7900XT. I think a lot of this probably comes down to marketing where AMD wasn't as clear as they should have been about the performance expectations of these GPUs. They kind of set themselves up for failure in that regard with the 7900XTX. Some reason a lot of people thought it would meet or exceed a 4090. That was never really going to be the case. That is not reasonable to expect. Uh, and probably AMD should have set the stage a little clearer there for that. We tried to do it back when they announced the cards and we got yelled at. So uh, some, some more, more, more honest marketing would be good and would do AMD a lot of favors here to make sure the community doesn't build these parts up to this expectation that is purely unachievable because it then sort of demolishes the reception at time of review publication where people are like, but what happened? And it actually just performed as 
it realistically would have the entire time. So XTX, we, we thought reasonably it was uh, not that bad of a performer, but I guess if you were expecting it to outperform a 4090, then you would never be satisfied anyway. As for the drivers, uh, don't expect the drivers to improve to a point where it's going to gain like 30 plus percent in gaming performance across the board or something. That is ridiculous. It's not realistic. And to think that a driver update is going to suddenly turn a $1,000 card into something that competes with a $1,600 card, it's just not in reality. So a little bit of a, an expectation check there. The XT maybe will improve to more um, regularly equal the 4080 or something, but that's kind of the most you're going to get out of these. So just one other note here, kind of heart to heart at a consumer level of how to deal with these major silicon launches. We don't review the future, uh, and if we did, we wouldn't be reviewing GPUs. I'd probably be reviewing like stock prices and lottery numbers, but we don't review the future. And in the same way we don't review the future and the possibility that drivers might improve something, you shouldn't be buying the future or the possibility that the drivers will get better. We said the same thing with the Intel Arc reviews, where it was like these drivers, at the time we reviewed the cards, they were utterly trash. And we basically said you shouldn't buy these with the expectation that one day it's going to suddenly be ultra competitive. You should only buy it if you just want something interesting and new to play around with. And that was kind of the start and the end of it. And uh, we have a story about Intel's DX9 driver update, by the way. So they actually delivered. That's where we can start talking about it. But for AMD's XTX and XT, uh, just just keep keep the expectations in check there um, because the, there's limitations to how much dr magic drivers can do. Up next, we just wanted to share some interesting background story on some behind the scenes um, interactions with Intel. Some of our viewers have been reaching out recently over the past couple months now and have been telling us about a ModMat and a toolkit that Intel released that, well, kind of released anyway to, to some like media partners basically, and uh, told us that these ModMats and toolkits reminded the viewers of our designs. And we were well aware of these efforts. We had elected to basically just let it go. We had conversations with Intel. Uh, we talked about it and we let it go. But there's been repeated outreach from viewers at this point. Um, honestly, it, for us, it's been a frustrating situation. Not the viewers emailing us, but the whole thing with Intel. And so we just wanted, it's time to just share some background on this so we can properly move on from it and just put it out there. So on June 1st of 2021, we released a video that was pretty critical of Intel's executive team, including the CEO, during a product announcement that they did. This is similar to what we do for all companies in their product announcements. Uh, I don't know if that particular one hit a nerve or something, but within 48 hours of publishing it, uh, our a close friend of mine whose company also runs our distribution, uh, manufacturing, our factory relations, basically he acts as our supplier, but he's a close friend I've known for a long time and runs the company. Um, we support each other. So he reached out to me as a courtesy because he had a pretty unique concern. And he said Intel had hired an agency to identify and locate him and then contact him and ask about our minimum order quantity or MOQ. They asked about uh, our cost to manufacture the mats. This is all about the mod mats. How many we make, our manufacturing process, our manufacturing techniques. Uh, the materials we use and expressed directly that Intel would like to make an Intel version of the Gamers Nexus mod mat. Specifically, they were referencing the Gamers Nexus mod mat. Uh, mind you, they had cut us out of this entire conversation and tried to circumvent us by going to effectively our supplier, not knowing that that supplier is a close friend of mine and there's a lot of loyalty, so he told me. And th that loyalty goes both ways because we both take our ethical obligations very seriously. For him, it's manufacturing. For us, it's the reviewing of products. So anyway, they did all of this without ever contacting Gamers Nexus. Uh, and this first took place on the phone. He did not really provide much information to all the questions they were asking because he also had a weird feeling about it, just like I did. He immediately called me, let me know the situation. Uh, remember, this is about a year ago, over a year. It's like a year and a half ago or something. Uh, I immediately contacted our Intel rep, said, hey, uh, did you guys like need to ask us for help making something or what's going on? He said he'd look into it. 
And um, Intel's a large company. There's a lot of links in the chain. So our rep didn't know anything about it. it you know, there's over 100,000 people there. So OK. About a day goes by. And Intel's agency that they had hired to do this digging emailed our supplier once again. And uh, they, s they asked about who makes the mats, where do the mats ship from, uh, how long do they take to make, and we're asking again about quantities and costs. So the amount of digging was a red flag for us, and honestly, it was starting to make me feel uncomfortable because remember the context here, we had just released a video that was sort of making fun of some of the Intel executives. So the timing was bizarre. Our supplier responded to them very politely with the following. He said, quote, hello, uh, names. Thank you for reaching out again. While I sincerely appreciate your communications and hope that we can work together in some capacity in the future, I feel that there may be a conflict of interest with our respective clients and this specific product, and will respectfully have to pass on this product. We take our ethical obligations very seriously, as we would with you and your clients of working together, and aren't able to proceed if we feel there may be competing interests. I apologize for any inconvenience this may cause. If Intel would like to make any other products, or if you have other clients who need assistance, I would love to talk further. I'm available if you would like to talk in the future and hope we can do business together with a different product. Please let me know if you need anything. Thanks. Look, there's, there's no issue with a company trying to make a product in an existing field. That's what we did. We made mouse mats, mouse pads, uh, we've done glassware, we've done bar runners, we've done coasters, and although all of these things are obviously quite unique, uh, they are existing fields, and there's nothing wrong with trying to do that. We didn't invent ESD mats or toolkits, and if a company wants to make ESD mats and toolkits, that's fine. Um, they've been around forever. We did, however, find the timing to be very strange. Basically, what is it? What is it you all are trying to do here? So we assumed this would end at that last email I just read, but it did not. Over the past year and a half, our supplier has dealt with repeated attempts at contact and information gathering from Intel, including phone calls, emails, and purchases through our GN store website that were shipped to various Intel campuses, including an Intel product research and development campus in Shanghai, China. They then showed or released a few items that look very similar to our toolkit and mod map back to back. It was just kind of an extremely odd and slimy way of going about this whole situation, especially with cutting us out of the loop while finding our supplier and directly telling him we want to make a Gamers Nexus style mod map. Um, but not talking to us. You know, Intel is a multi-billion dollar company, uh, many, many multi-billions. It owns its own factories. It owns its own fabrication plants. Uh, it, it employs 121,000 people. Intel can make whatever the hell it wants to make, and it can probably do it all in-house. So they don't need our help to make products. They don't need to contact our supplier, local supplier, and friend of mine to do digging. Uh, they can make any product that they can imagine. So that's kind of the context here. That's why it was so strange. And so, so to us, the way it all lined up, the contact days after a critical review, um, and actually there were a couple other uh, pretty critical videos we had of Intel around that same time, critical video of their executives, their direct reference to wanting to make a mod mat like Gamers Nexus, their request of quotes for the two exact sizes that we make, uh, without talking to GN itself and making designs of a mod map and a toolkit that honestly look pretty similar to ours, even though, yes, there's some amount of sort of retooling or modification of existing products, it just it was strange. And ordering our products to ship to an Intel product research facility on top of all this, repeatedly calling and emailing a friend of mine to fish for information, all of this spanning the course of about two years, it just felt to us like some kind of weird intimidation attempt. And honestly, I don't think that's necessarily what it was. I think uh, Occam's razor works here where I, I think probably what this is, is a uh, someone in marketing got a cute idea that, hey, gamers like these things. Um, I mean, the mod mats look like, come on. They, they said they want to make a Gamers Nexus mod mat. So, I think someone in marketing said it would be cute to make a Gamers Nexus mod map, but with uh, instead of a circular GN logo in the middle, we do a circular Intel logo. And um, that's the most charitable interpretation that I have. Anyway, uh, whether or not the charitable interpretation is true, the fact of the matter is 
it was weird and uncomfortable for us. So that's all we're going to say on this story. We've been trying to ignore this for a couple years now. I've never brought it up. This isn't a standalone video. It's not a massive investigation video. I didn't even put it at the front of the news. So we're kind of trying to just move on, but I did want this to be out there because it's been odd. Um, so we're not, I mean, that's going to be it. We're just sharing some of the facts of the situation because of that. Now, as far as Intel, uh, we've never had any issue with our PR contact or the engineers or the people who make like the CPUs and the GPUs. We've smoothed it all over, I think. Uh, and we'll see what the agencies do. But we've smoothed it all over and um, we're good with our contacts there. So the company's big and disconnected. You have to remember that where uh, it's not like PR and engineers know what the other 100,000 people are doing. And um, so I think we're good, at least on the product and the reviews side. As far as this, we're not going to be revisiting the topic unless there's some major change uh, because I just I don't view it as core to what we do in testing product review, stuff like that. Uh, unless they decide to make it more core to what we do. So speaking of our core job, let's do it and talk about something uh, related to Intel that is actually positive, something good that Intel has going on. So Intel does deserve some mention for this. So Intel's made some tangible improvements now in Arc. Uh, these aren't rumors. This is actually materialized in the software. It's something you can download now. They released a blog post detailing the increase in performance for Intel's drivers, especially with older APIs that are still in use, actually. And this driver is called V3959. DX9 includes many older games, but also some really popular esports titles. So CSGO has gotten a massive uplift here, according to Intel. Arc has had a weak spot with these older APIs, even with DX11, as Intel focused on the newest stuff, like DX12 and Vulkan first. Intel's first party testing, and we'll try to get around to looking at this ourselves, shows at 1080p a claim of a 1.79x change in CSGO, an uplift. 1.4x was shown in StarCraft II, and 1.3x was shown in League of Legends. Despite the age of these games, these are still some of the most played esports games on PC, at least globally, and so Intel wanted to highlight them in particular. Guild Wars 2 and Payday 2 are included in the chart, but didn't gain much from the update. We don't know if that's due to a lack of specific tuning for those games, or if maybe there are other limitations, such as the engine itself. To provide more detail, Intel also included a frame time plot from CSGO. It's easy to see the much more consistent performance of the new driver by looking at the white line that's shown in the plot. It hovers around 3 milliseconds with a few spikes higher throughout. This is in contrast to the gray line behind it, which shows wildly inconsistent performance. That's the original. It's good to see Intel showing a chart like this in addition to average FPS and 99th percentile because it gives an unfiltered view of the performance. And there's an accompanying video where Intel's Ryan Shrout and Tom Peterson discuss the update, but that's pretty much all that there was in the post. This is the kind of thing Intel needs to keep focusing on, fixing fundamental performance issues for Arc. The rest of the driver and the software needs to work as well, but running games is kind of the primary goal, and Intel knows this. The end of Intel's post reads the following, quote, We won't be stopping here. We still have more work to do. Further improvements for games based on legacy APIs and general driver enhancements are on their way, and future drivers will continue to march to a refined and more performant product. So back to the review in the future thing. Uh, you know, that, that's great that they want to do that, and we'll talk about it when they do. In the meantime, we'll probably try sort of structuring around uh, time off people have for the holidays. We'll probably try and run the ARC cards through another set of benchmarks to see how they do on, uh, on the benchmark suite now that they've been updated after a few months. So next one, the budget PC market has been struggling lately, not just CPUs and GPUs that have been largely on the more expensive side, but also in the case market, for example, where the days of the $50 to $60 quality case have kind of ended. Cooler Master has abandoned that market segment. They're focusing on the $100 plus category. Corsair largely has abandoned it as well. They kind of start at the $80 plus area. Fractal and Lee and Lee are both fighting fiercely at $100 plus. So there's not been much in the $60 to $70 price point other than uh, trash or things that are um, from lesser known companies. So Montec with the X3, for example, that's the case they're best known for. Uh, that's been at the $65 to $70 price point for a while now. It's been our best budget selection for about two years at this point because there just hasn't been any real competition, at least anything that's stayed in that price category. So like the Landcool 215, for example, has fluctuated a bit. Anyway, 
We visited Montech while we were out in Taiwan, and the company is now working on launching a lot of new cases for uh, early next year. They are both high-end and budget class cases, which is great to see. And the company is moving more towards custom tooling and trying to establish itself as a brand that's actually trying and not just sort of customizing and rebranding existing tooling from Sama or some supplier like that. So these are the ones we think you should pay attention to. They're coming out May and April of 2023. There's a $65 Montec X4, now a thicker, uh, higher quality steel for construction. It still runs six fans included, and it has Type-C USB. There's a $60 Air 903, now with a 51% porosity for better airflow and thermal performance. There's a Sky 2GX, uh, fun fact, I asked, what does the GX stand for? And the answer was, was, was basically gaming X. Um, and I said, what does the X stand for? And, and it doesn't, it stands for X. Anyway, the Sky 2X is a $100 case with high porosity for airflow. And then finally, at the higher end, Montag is introducing the King 95. Unfortunately, we think this is their least interesting case. Uh, because it's kind of more of just another O11D inspired chassis. Not that exciting to us at this point. But they also have an Air 3000 Max that we'll talk about. It's got a pop-out dust filter and some other interesting features. The biggest trend here for Montag is they're trying to get into more custom stuff. So they have custom tooling for most of these cases. Uh, if you don't know, tooling for a case costs typically in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. We've heard as high as a million dollars. Depends on how elaborate the case is. Most of them tend to be in the low hundreds of thousands, depending on... on if they're able to work well, how, how complex the metalwork is and the bending and stamping, but also if they're able to work with any existing tooling to sort of integrate it together into the chassis. They also got rid of things like the Molex Centipede we made fun of them for in the past. Uh, Montec is now moving to a more standard daisy chain four pin fan connectors for their cases, so that's good to see as well. And they've improved the airflow, they punched more holes in to improve the porosity or the sort of ratio of hole to metal at the front of the case. And these are all good changes that show the company is listening. So this section, we're going to talk about some of the cases in detail now. It's a little longer than a normal news section for cases because we were actually there and got to see these really cool early prototypes that they made by hand just to show off. So the X4, it runs three 140 mil front fans. They're all RGB, not ARGB. And it has three 120 mil fans throughout the case. They played around with higher porosity at something like 56%, but would have had to sacrifice the geometric shapes you see on the front panel to gain only five percentage points of additional holes. And then there's the question of making the holes too large and flimsy and allowing more dust anyway. The X4 is mostly interesting for its new tooling and price tag at $65. The metal has increased from 0.45 to 0.5 millimeters thick on the old X3 to 0.6 to 0.7 mil thick on the new X4. This is closer to the standard thickness for a case in this price range. Just for frame of reference, a lot of the really high-end nice cases, they might push to like one millimeter thickness for the steel. Um, it's rare you see above that, and, unless it's aluminum. And typically, they're in the range of like 0 0.6 to 0 0.8 millimeters thick for steel. So this is much closer to a quality case. You don't get that like wobbly noise when you, when you flex the panels like you would with 0 0.45. The $100 Sky 2GX is also interesting. These cases support true SSI EEB motherboards. Some manufacturers call this EATX. That's not a thing. We have a video on it. But by using a slide-out motherboard extension tray, they can go to SSI EEB or just ATX. This can be removed for side intake when running normal ATX or used for large motherboards instead. It also functions as a cable management cover, and there are options for a glass front or a mesh front. There's also a horizontal or vertical GPU orientation, but vertical sets it farther back and away from the glass. And there are new prototype fans that we got a preview of. The Air 3000 Max is also interesting. This one leverages the new extended motherboard tray as well, but also begins playing around with some mechanical elements familiar to what Lee and Lee is trying to do. The front dust filter has a pop-up mechanism for easier access. The front goes for a plastic grill faceplate for some flair, and otherwise sticks with side mount option. As for the Kid 95, that one is still bereft of a unique identity for Montec. The company is building its own tooling now, which is great because they've gotten their footing and they're trying to make progress, but they still need some brand identity and some unique flair here. The Kid 95 feels too much like an 011 style case. We've seen a lot of these now. Uh, it actually gets really hard to review these, even if people are interested in them. Uh, the, the sort of like inspired by cases. 
And that's because you put them in the thumbnail, which is most of the traffic on YouTube, and people can't really tell at a glance. They just think it's another O11D video, even if it's something new. So anyway, we'd like to see something a little more unique there. As for the rest, Montec showed us their new air coolers, their new power supplies, and they showed us a test report they had from uh, a, I think, a professor at a university who ran some computational fluid dynamics tests on different fin densities, heat pipe densities, heat pipe sizes for heat sinks. And the point of all of that was uh, they're actually trying to engineer something, not just sort of buy it off the shelf and simply rebrand it. So that's pretty cool that they're doing some design changes. You, know, you always have to start with basically rebranding stuff, especially if it's as expensive as cases are, because reasonably a startup can't afford the, say, half a million dollars to buy case tooling. Massive risk. You don't have a market yet. No one knows who you are. Good luck selling half a million dollars worth of cases if that's just your tooling cost plus whatever else you need for salary. So. It's normal for a case company to start like Montec did, basically do some slightly tweaked rebrands and then compete on price because that's where the only place you can compete. And then it's up to the company to try and decide, okay, now is, we're going to pull the trigger on this and really commit and try and grow. Uh, and it looks like they're trying to do that. So that's pretty cool. Anyway, we'll follow up on this in April and May when the cases come out. Up next, a leak. Harukazi 5719 on Twitter shared a table of NVIDIA 70 class GPUs, including the alleged upcoming 4070 Ti and an unannounced 4070. The leak claims that the 4070 will be based on a cut down version of AD104. Now, that's the same chip that's in the 4080. Sorry, uh, that one was unlaunched. The 4070 Ti. It's the same chip as is in the 4070 Ti. Generationally, the die size on AD104. Is at uh, is down actually at 282 millimeters ampere. The previous generation for a similar class GPU, that one was 100 millimeters squared larger. So at 282 millimeters squared uh, versus something like 382 or so. The alleged 4070 for CUDA core count is running 5888, and that's compared to the 7680 of the 4070 Ti. These two make more sense by name than 4812 gigabyte for the 7600 CUDA core version. The chart shows the non-TI as also having fewer ROPs, tensor cores, and RT cores. However, the memory configuration is allegedly the same across both cards. Both the 4070 and the alleged 4070 TI have a 12 gigabyte GDDR6X config on a 192 bit wide bus. That bus is pretty narrow, but when compared with the 21 gigabit per second memory, it results in a bandwidth of 504 gigabytes per second. That's less than the 3070 Ti, despite its lower capacity of slower VRAM due to the bus difference. Now, at the same time, it's higher than the 3070 non-Ti. So these are weird cards, man. I'm not sure how, not really sure how these are going to do. We'll see when we test. The price is really what's going to matter here. Memory bandwidth is one of the things, though, that it's got a lot of factors into it. There's largely physical factors of the cards, not just the memory modules that are chosen, but the memory controllers present. So uh, it's normally a little more complicated than just memory bandwidth for performance or VRAM capacity. Typically, those things start to matter a lot more as you push higher resolutions, like say 4K, high resolution textures, things like that. But uh, we'll just have to test it to know. Now, moving on, the leak also shows some boost clocks. So it claims a 2610 megahertz boost for both the 4070 SKUs, which is quite a bit higher than the previous generation, obviously, because it's new architecture, and the 40 series cards in general clock faster than 30. TDPs shown are pretty close. The 4070 is claimed at 250 watts, only 35 watts below the 4070 Ti. If this info is correct, it really drives home how strange it would have been for the 4070 Ti to be called 4080 gigabyte. It's got so much in common with the leaked 4070 this naming makes a lot more sense. NVIDIA clearly realized that when they unlaunched it, a rare and sort of historic move for the company, but ultimately the performance and the price are what matter, and uh, we'll, we'll be testing that as soon as we can. Up next, a feel-good story for the end of the year. So EVGA had a couple of those 4090s, sorry, next-gen graphics around. So they have a 4090, basically FTW3. It's the same model as the one that we tore apart and did a... Uh, teardown of on the channel, one of a very limited quantity of cards, and they auctioned it off. The auction's over. Sorry if you missed it, but they auctioned it off for St. Jude's, which EVGA has been working with for a very long time. We were talking about uh, what to do with these cards with the company when we were out in Taiwan, and they ended up posting it on their forums for auction. Originally it went to eBay, and then eBay, I think, banned them because they thought it was suspicious or something. Uh, they talked to eBay. It was never fixed. 
Anyway, they auctioned it on the forum, and here's the good part. Uh, it sold for $12,000, $12,400 to the highest bidder. Uh, it ended on the 16th of December. The card is fully functional, but they sold it as is with no warranty because obviously really cool display piece. Uh, not many of them in the world at this point. And um, a great cause too, because EVJ has been working with St. Jude's a long time. We've done some, some streams with them, overclocking streams, supporting it as well. And uh, I, I, just, I was personally happy to see they were able to send at least one big stack of cash over to St. Jude's on the way out of the GPU business. I'm sure they'll try and do more, but you know, I mean, the business is a different size with that video card. So that was nice to see, and I'm glad someone was able to get a very rare 4090 from EVGA so they can put it in their collection. All right, next one, EK Water Blocks has a special edition RX 7900 XTX block that they've launched. The block is mostly a cosmetic difference. So we previously covered the standard EK offering and all the same functional characteristics apply here. The water block has front and back plates made from black anodized aluminum, almost entirely enclosing the card. The design takes heavy inspiration from the AMD reference air cooler design. Geometry and cuts in the surface make it look pretty good overall without being too garish or too minimal. We'd like to see more interesting block designs similar to this as the market is dominated by super clean blank slabs. What we didn't like too much was the $330 price tag for it. So it's $80 over the EK standard quantum vector squared block, which is like the same vein, except it's it doesn't say radio on it on it in the same way. Uh, it's basically as much as an entire CPU on its own. It's supposed to be a special edition, yes, but when the cooler is this expensive, eh, it especially, I mean, it's a third the price almost of a 78 XTX, so it just stops kind of making sense unless you really, really want it to look a certain way, but um, that puts you into like 4080 territory for an air cooler, and even though the 4080 is not a great deal, uh, it does feel kind of bad to invest that much. So the $80 cheaper for the normal one makes more sense than this does. Up next, Cooler Master loses its mind with a $15,000 chair. I sat in it in one of our videos recently. Here's a look at what we thought. This thing is an absolutely ridiculous chair. It has multiple monitors that can mount to the arms. They're not included. It promises all kinds of immersion, including haptics in your ass region. And additionally, uh, it basically consumes you when you push the button to close the orb down. If you're curious, this thing is eight feet tall at its tallest, so it'll just barely fit in most US homes. Might touch the ceiling a little bit. Uh, it's upholstered with real leather. It has matching padded armrests, a large swiveling desk. It has a wireless charging pad. It has a footrest. Uh, the footrest was a little weird. And the entire top of the Orb X raises and lowers along with the monitors to allow the user to climb inside. Like they're opening to jack into the matrix or something. And once you're inside the Orb X, you're fully immersed. So hopefully you don't have to go to the bathroom or something because you, you need to push the button and it kind of takes a while. It's not, oh no, it's not done yet. It's still going. <laughs> What's it doing? The left armrest has an I.O. panel attached to it with multiple USB ports, a headphone jack, and a couple of controls. There might even be a cup holder back there. I'd have to go back and look, I don't remember. And for the monitors, Cooler Master recommends using either a single 34 inch wide or three 27 inch screens. The seat itself has multiple ways to adjust for comfort via a remote, Honestly, we're surprised Cooler Master didn't throw in the word dimension there somewhere. The Orbex also has a full set of speakers with five inch subwoofer under the ass for haptics. It's like, a, it's a new form of haptics. They just blast sound at your ass while you're sitting there playing games. Uh, Cooler Master posted this on its YouTube channel showcasing the possible uses for the, the throne, I guess, including apparently an impromptu meeting in a lobby uh, of a giant office building playing racing games with a keyboard, impressive, or using it in the middle of a bar. I don't know, man, but it's, anyway, it's 15 grand. There's two colorways. Uh, 15 grand was the estimate they gave us. It might cost more. It will ship in a ginormous crate, so it will be shipped freight. Uh, it's very tall, and if you're wondering, you know, ha ha, very funny, this is all stupid, kind of like, honestly, we were when we first looked at it, I did ask Cooler Master, so is there a market or is this just like a marketing halo thing? And there is a market and it made sense when we asked them. So the market is location-based entertainment, like arcades. Uh, apparently in parts of Asia, especially, there's some demand for these because 
esports cafes, PC banes, stuff like that, like in Korea, want to set them up for people to come in and pay some money to get time on the orb. So that kind of makes sense. Uh, or extremely wealthy and you have nothing else to do with your money, I guess. That, that, that works too. That's it for the news this week. Thanks for watching. As always, packed episode. Really fun to be back and work on the, these. But we have a ton of factory tours coming up and lots of cool stories we want to tell from our Taiwan trip. Been working on editing all those. And uh, Christmas Day, so December 25th, we're going to be launching a super cool video that features EVGA, basically a last look at some of the GPU facilities they had there. It's not just the Kingdom Lab Tour. It's everything. Really excited about that, so subscribe and check back for it. And thank you for watching. Go to store.cameraxis.net to grab something like a mod mat, coaster pack, or something else from our store, and we'll give 10% of it through the promotion to the local uh, computer engineering class nearby. Thanks for watching. We'll see you all next time.